my guests for this morning, Kweku Asari, he's fellow CDD Ghana and DND fellow for public law and justice. He's joining us from the United States of America. Thank you so very much, Professor Kweku Asari, for making the time this morning to join us. Thank you for having me, Samson. I we appreciate the invitation, especially on Independence Day. Right. <laughs> we appreciate your sacrifice. We know what time it is, where you are. Yao Diopong is lawyer, senior lecturer, Ghana School of Law, and member of Kufrado's legal team in the Just Ended Petition. Dr. Reina Akumperia is lawyer and member John Mahama and NDC's national legal team. Gentlemen, thank you very much for making the time to join us. It's good to be here. It's a pleasure to be here. Shortly, we will also be joined by Dr. Enes Kofi Abochi, who is Dean UPSA Law School. Now, without much ado, we will go straight to our very first issue that we are canvassing for you. And as you know today, special Independence Day. We are here until 12.30. And this show is brought to you by the candidate sponsorship of Bank of Africa, as strong as a group and as close as a partner. MTN everywhere you go. <coughs> Ashasi University, educating ethical and entrepreneurial leaders for Africa. Juroplast, where Juroplast goes, water flows having mosquito spray and coil, pleasant on humans, tough nightmare on insects. And Napa Foods, it is tasty. DBS Industries, if you're looking for anything roofing that is lasting, that is where to look. Robert and Sons Limited Optical Services, your comprehensive eye care services provider. So let me begin with um, Professor Kweku. Uh, sorry. Now, you were one of those who suggested when the Auditor General Daniel Yao Domelevo was asked to go on leave for 167 days, you were one of those who suggested very early on that that amounted to sort of some constructive dismissal. And you did not just stay with criticism in the public. You actually proceeded to the Supreme Court to challenge the basis and constitutionality of what happened. What do you make of the latest? Well, something. Thanks again. Uh, I'm not too surprised by the latest. And for us to make progress, let us go back to the pre-independence days when a profound statement was made by Dr. Nkrumah to the effect that seek ye first the political kingdom and all else shall be added unto thee. And over the years, that statement has been interpreted in diverse ways. One school of thought believes that that statement means if you are able to obtain executive power, that's the political kingdom, that's the executive power, all else, all the institutions of the state could easily be added, unfortunately, including the institutional buffers of our democracy, the independent constitutional agencies, the Ministry of Justice, the police. If you are able to garner the political kingdom, then you can co-opt all that. I call that the winner takes all governance approach, or we go for sure, we go, we go. So there are some in the country 
who believe in this Uyghur ideology. Politicians, as well as even independent constitutional officers. Then, of course, there is the Fourth Republic Constitution. When you read the preamble, it talks about limited government. Government only has power to the extent that that power has been allocated to it by the Constitution. And I've called that good governance, go go, go go. So there's a constant struggle since our independence between those who stand for Gogo and those who stand for Wigo. And I believe some of that is playing out here. I want to ask the question, well, why would the president even do this? What is the theory to explain what has happened? In my opinion, the president did an economic calculus. And he reasoned that the benefit to him from dismissing the auditor general outweighs any cost to him. Cost include uh, losing some votes and voters, losing some uh, believers in constitutional governance, uh, losing even some people in his own party who are stickless for good governance, perhaps being smacked down by the Supreme Court, but he has to calculate the probability that the Supreme Court will smack him down. And I believe that calculation was that maybe it won't happen. And then you have to weigh it against the benefit to him. What is the benefit to him of dismissing the Auditor General? The benefit to him is that the, this Auditor General is not the Auditor General auditing the presidency and the other executive agencies. Or this Auditor General is so, I, I don't know the word, it, 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 it's so maybe effective that we don't want to expose some government dealings and government documents to him. So it's a cost-benefit analysis. And in the end, the president calculated, look, I have to dismiss the person. Now, having decided to dismiss the person, then the question is, what tool do you use? What tool do you use? The tool that the president used was the audit standard board, the board, the audit service board, the board, right? You know, the board has three nominees from the presidency, including uh, uh, pre uh, uh, Professor Ajimari, yeah, Ajima. who incidentally is a former auditor general, and we should never do that again, allow a former auditor general to sit on the board of the audit service. Once you serve, you should be allowed to go you shouldn't be allowed to come back and interfere with the function of the extant Auditor General like is happening now. So the Auditor, uh, the board was the tool. And he would go through the board, and you see that the board will go and dig and dig and dig and find something. It's one, one thing or the other. First, it was, oh, you have been taking your leave, and so go on 167 days leave. And then as the 167 days approached, they tried to find something. They went to do an audit of the Auditor General. They hired a private accounting firm to do an audit of the Auditor General, which, by the way, is also unconstitutional because that is the remit of parliament. That auditor found nothing. So then they had to do something. I believe they hired some independent investigators, and they unlawfully assess SNIT data. I believe Shraj should investigate how they got the Shraj data, SNIT. and furthermore, how someone's social security records were leaked so shamelessly onto Facebook. If you are going to be a country and you are going to trust our institutions, 
if I give my information to the social security uh, uh, people, SNET, I expect that that will be kept confidential. The presidency doesn't have any power to have access to that data, let alone leak that data shamelessly to Facebook. And if that happens, there should be consequences. It, this cannot happen in just about any country. It's a, breach. That, it's a breach of the Data Protection Act. It's a breach of the Constitution because this is a, a privacy right. It's a privacy right. And so they went to that route. The auditing route failed. Then the investigators found something. They said the citizenship, he was Togolese. Very dangerous. Very dangerous. Here you are. You wrote a memo saying the person's mother is a Ghanaian, and you are saying the person is a Togolese. How low can we get in the country? And then they went to the age. The age, they said, the passport says he's 59. The baptismal record says he's 59. All the documents says, uh, say he's 59. But we found some corrected data, which said he's 60, he was born 1 June 1960. So that is the one we are going to stick with. It's almost like the elections that we did. And then somebody says the Electoral Commission changed numbers. And we just want to stick with one number that he said is wrong. But we want to stick with that. Here we were with the president challenging that type of thinking, and yet using the same type of thinking when it comes to the Domlevo case, where on the record, it is clear that he's 59 and has, as you said, only three months to serve. And yet, because of the economic tax loss, he felt Domlevo has to go. And, and in all this, and, and, and on the on the Benesnet beneficiary form you talk about, uh, the beneficiary form that he signed on the 25th of October, 1993, the SNIT number actually reveals he was born on the day he insists he was born and the date he insists he was born, correct? Yes, correct. And you see, that document that was leaked, and I, I, I strongly suggest that Shride should investigate, I believe that document itself is doctored. Because if you read that document carefully, you find out that there's the date of birth which says uh, June 1, 1960. But when you look at the SNIT number itself, and you know how to read the SNIT number, you find that that says he was born on June 1, 1959. Yeah. Many people cannot not interpret possible snake to numbers, have so they wouldn't know. Card with those two numbers, mm. those two uh, uh, data points, because they are inconsistent. And the reason they are inconsistent is because somebody is messing with the data. And that's a shame. But, I mean, but I what do you know how the, about, we want to about the same, about the same uh, form? What do you make of it? So what the president has informed us now is that he has taken a decision on the basis of a beneficiary form. Now, what do we know? Does a SNIT beneficiary form affect a change of uh, date of birth and nationality? Uh, no, absolutely not. Uh, of course, these are even judicial questions. The president doesn't have the power to make these de determinations if you doubt that somebody is not a citizen of Ghana or somebody's age is not his age. You don't decide that at the office of the president. You go to court like they did with the uh, Balongun case and the Shalabi case and the Olympio case and so on. And in each of those cases that I cite, the government was actually found out to be wrong because citizenship is very complex. And in the case of them level, there's clear evidence that the Ghanaian is even preposterous to waste any time, uh, you know, 
talking about uh, the fact that he's not a Ghanaian. And the age issue is equally preposterous because we have his baptismal record. We have family members who can tell us when he was born. We have his passport. We have so many documents, and then we are insisting on this one merely because this one allows us to perpetrate an agenda. There was a predetermined agenda to get rid of the guy. And look, if it wasn't the audit or the accumulated leave or the citizenship or the age, it could have been something else. When he was in secondary school, he did not go to the farm when he was supposed to go, and therefore we are getting rid of him. It. It's, it's laughable. It's laughable. Mm. Okay. Now, something, the presidency, of course, is clearly at fault. But we will miss the picture if we don't put the blame, the ultimate blame, in the proper place. The Constitution itself anticipates these type of disputes between independent constitutional officers and the people that they exercise uh, uh, and, the, and, and the other branches of government. So, for instance, the Auditor General audits the presidency, and one would expect that there will be friction if the Auditor General keeps finding expenses that the president is uh, incurring that is not happy with. The natural tendency of any president is to get rid of him. And government itself is of limited power. There's separation of power vertically and horizontally. There are checks and balances. For all that to work, you need someone that is charged with enforcing the Constitution. And the beauty of our Constitution is what I call the triangle defense to enforcing the Constitution. The Constitution gives standing to anyone who feels the Constitution is being violated to go to court, and when you go to court, they have jurisdiction. They can't say we won't take it because the constitution compels them to take the matter. And so in this case, we went to court. I went to court in July, July last year, and the court basically dismissed an injunction and then took a vacation on the substantive issue they came back up till now. The court has not found that the case is important enough to adjudicate it. The CSOs filed another rate in October. The same thing has happened to that rate. So you see that there is a clear abdication of responsibility by the court. And I loved when you were talking about your, whatever you call it, your legal talk, uh, rambocious and all that. Well. Look, it is not what people say that really affects the administration of justice and whether or not people respect the justice system. It is what the justices themselves do that influence how people view the court. So if you compare this Auditor General case to the December 31 case that you cited, the uh, then government, announced that it was going to celebrate the December 31 revolution on December 12, 1993. Immediately, the NPP government, uh, not the NPP government, the NPP as a political party, sued the attorney general, and the court ruled on the matter before December 31. It took the court a mere 10 days to instruct the parties to file all their papers and their writs and their arguments. And the court determined that because the court realized that if it did not decide the matter before December 31 and allowed the December 31 events to be celebrated, then it has taken sides mm. by inaction. And extending that analogy to the present case, by not adjudicating the matter, the court has taken the side of the president because the president is the one who is being accused of violating the Constitution. And if you sit there, then either 
you are saying, well, it's okay for the president to violate the constitution, or uh, if the, the, or the president is not violating the constitution and you don't want to tell us, or something else. Either way, it doesn't look very good at all. Okay. Now, look, Prof, I'll, I, I will, yeah. I will I'll return to you particularly on the subject of the delay in uh, hearing the suit. Um, now, Rena, you have also followed this discussion for a, a while now. There is this um, group of CSOs. You remember when Dom Levo was asked to go on leave? Uh, a good number of them, in the hundreds, came together and issued a statement condemning that uh, action. Uh, they have once again issued a statement, a coalition, coalition of CSOs against corruption. And in that statement, in the very penultimate paragraph, they say that the coalition note with regret that the Supreme Court is yet to determine two suits relating to the constitutionality of the Auditor General's forced accumulated leave by the President, which were filed by Professor Kweku Asari and nine CSOs in July and October 2020, respectively. In part, this unexplained delay in hearing these time-sensitive cases has rendered some of the issues raised before the court moot and has allowed a grave breach of the Constitution to fester in our estimation. So they are saying, blame the court too for what has happened to uh, Domelevo. There are those who start the, the, the suspicion from this point. The time he was asked to go and leave, it was such a critical time. He was prosecuting, his, if you like. <laughs> there was a matter that Yao Safuma, for senior minister, had taken against him because he had <laughs> surcharged him over the Kroll Associates contract, which he says there was no evidence of any uh, work done. Now, when the matter part of it went to the Supreme Court. And they were to go and inspect the documents as the uh, finance minister had indicated, things have now been ready, which didn't appear to be ready at the time he was asking for. This was the very time his leave matter came up and he was asked to leave the place. Then somebody took over and that person supervised that process. Then it is time for him to come back and then we go find you know, his date of birth from <laughs> beneficiary four, not where you should actually find a change of date of birth. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and I hereby wish happy independence to all Ghanaians. Uh, the issues that are before us today are very germane, especially because we're celebrating our, <clears throat> our independence. That's the 64th Independence Day celebration of our nation. And we have issues that are too important and too critical. When I was reading um, in terms of the context, and you've created the context very well, so let me just confirm that there is no doubt in my mind or any reasonable observer of the situation that it's a complete nexus between the events of the surcharge of a senior and important member of the government and the processes that Domelevo have been taken through from that point up to now. Uh, Prof has serialized them, and there's no doubt in my mind that there's a nexus. It is refreshing that we have the CSOs who are getting involved and they're putting pressure and they're playing their role. But I would like the issue to be broader than that. I would like the media to take this out of the context of Domelevo and frame the issue as the fight for corruption. This is the proper, proper context of the issue. It is not about just the removal of one officer, one constitutional officer. It's broader than that. It's bigger than that. It's about whether there is the energy and the appetite to fight corruption in this country. And this is the evidence we are seeing. I am surprised that we have a citizen today 
who is not getting justice from the executive? And it's equally not justice. And I'm responding to the specific question that you have raised. In 1958, I refer you to the case of Balogun versus Eduse. Right. You know, yeah. you know, it has variously been said that Kwame Nkrumah was a dictator, a constitutional dictator. But these are the period that we have citizens who are purportedly Nigerians getting justice in our courts. And you know it's a contempt matter, but you know the facts are very clear for every lawyer and law student that Krobo Dusoe, who was then the interior minister at the time, purportedly singled out four Nigerians or four Ghanaian Nigerians uh, and singled, out, uh, singled them out for deportation. They filed <clears throat> race of habeas corpus in the, in the high court, challenging the, the constitutionality of, of their supposed deportation. And whilst the matter was pending, and on the day that the, the case was adjourned, it did say, despite the matter pending in court, purportedly deported them. And the issue of contempt arose. And the court was very emphatic. There was no process court. There was no even evidence that the processes were served on the minister. But he was held in contempt. And he was a leading member of the government at the time. I want to see that same spirit and that same appetite to protect citizens' rights. We're talking about the middle today. Mm. Tomorrow, we're talking about someone else's uncle, and another citizen. And we have to create a system that is fair and just to everyone. What you just said reminds me, yeah. reminds me of uh, a, a recent situation, which is similar. Yes. Um, Gary Nimakomafo was doing this case for an Indian or so. And while the matter was being fought in the court, oh. there's an Indian who is in Ghana yes, who has a business. Exactly. That's true. And whilst everything was going on in the court, the guy is picked and thrown out of the country. The country. And there are some other foreign nationals in this country yes. who have faced a similar situation yes. where the, the, the machinery of states is used to unlawfully remove them when they are seeking to fight for their rights in the country. Exactly. So, uh, so let, me, let me reiterate that. You said you are sad. That's what you used. I'm, I'm crushed. Mm. You know, I'm crushed because I don't know I could be the one that would be facing the fate that Tomilevo is facing. This is a citizen. He's one of the committed citizens we have in this country. All he's doing is performing his constitutional duties. I am surprised that despite the clear provisions of the Constitution, and I'll take you to Article uh, 187, mm -hmm. that provides for the removal of, uh, of, the, uh, of the Auditor General, not so. Mm -hmm. If you go to 187, you can help me. No, of course, 187 refers to Article 46. Okay. A removal of justices of the court. So it's the same thing. Now, Article 146. 146, yeah. 146. Is that okay? There's a procedure. If the intent, the objective is to remove the malevolent by all means, use the procedure. This is the same procedure you employed in Charlotte O'Shea's case. Why, why is it not whether there's propriety in that procedure is a different question altogether. But at least you are seen to be evoking the rules and the procedural. Otherwise, how are we able to tell whether an executive action is proper or not proper? We have to have regard to the rules. Did you answer the issue of the court being isolated to also take part of the blame in this matter? Yes, um, it's very clear. Um, this matter is before their lordships. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? It's before their lordships. The, the institution the final institution that protects the individual, the individual, our liberties, individual rights that are guaranteed now uh, by letter and spirit under Article 5 of our Constitution, it is the court. And that is why is there should be a sense of urgency. This is the court that must be interested in protecting fundamental rights. And they have done that in the, in, in the past. They've done that even in Kwame Nkrumah's time. Our courts are some of the veritable institutions that protect the rights of individuals even aliens, because the Constitution does not, especially when it creates terms, very generous terms, that every other person or every person is entitled to. That's what it always says. Mm. Every person is entitled to. That person, it doesn't distinguish or discriminate between whether you're Indian, 
whether you are Ghanaian, whether you are from Togo, or wherever you are from. It is but what, what would you have done if you were in the position of the president and the board chair brings a recommendation that has documentation supporting, suggesting that the man has two different, but, yeah, uh, but, two but, different but, uh, dates of birth. But, but some said. We will prefer the, the 1961. Yeah. And then, uh, which would mean that he, he should have left office uh, long ago, last year. And then he also signed a beneficiary form when he was 17 years old. And in that uh, form, he indicated that he is Togolese. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to... What would you do if you were I, the, I'm going the, to read. the president? The president is a lawyer. Mm. So sometimes when I speak about the president, what he does or that, what he doesn't do, I assume certain basic knowledge that he has of the law. I'm going to take you to Article 187, Clause... Um, let me see, Article... Article 187, you are on the Auditor General. Auditor General, yes. Uh -huh. there's, there's a provision about his age mm. and, and, and all that. It's 199. No, not 187. Well, he has done. Okay, so this is article. Yeah, yeah, so this mm. is article 187 mm -hmm. plus 12. Okay. So, with your permission, if, if I. Let me just take this. One. Right. The, the, the salary and allowances payable to the Auditor General, his rights in respect of leave of absence. Retiring award or retiring age or retiring age shall not be varied to his disadvantage during the tenure of his office. So there's, there's, a, there's a particular provision of our constitution that actually precludes the president from doing what he's purporting to do. His, his, his decision is unconstitutional. I think there's no further question whether this is constructive removal and whether he's not being, being removed from the office. I, that, question has been answered, absolutely answered. And this provision, now, this issue about age, the Constitution says you cannot vary his condition. His age. His age. Mm. His, in fact, it was, it's very specific. Mm. Don't vary the retiring age to disadvantage. This is what Article 187, Clause 12, 12 is saying. Very specific. I assume the president is a lawyer. He's right. surrounded. You yes. Yeah. You know. Oh, no, I know. Mm. Well, I, I didn't go to school with him. So. <laughs> He's a lawyer, of course, very re renowned one. Right. Uh, yes, there's no question about that. But he's also surrounded by other smart lawyers. So first question that an executive should ask itself, is this enterprise I am embarking on, is this supported first by the Constitution? Because your own powers are derived from the Constitution. You don't have powers. You don't go to anywhere to derive your powers. That's unquestionable. Mm. But I'd like to refer to a, a Supreme Court ruling. Because mm. matters of the Auditor General have actually been to the Supreme Court already. OK? And it would be interesting to just, uh, let's pay some attention to this. In the case of William Brown versus Attorney General. Now, this, this issue was about the budget that the Auditor General had presented to the Finance Ministry. And they purportedly change the figures. They, I think they, had, they reduced some of the figures and sent it to parliament. Then the deputy, uh, I think William Brown was the deputy AG at the time, and he questioned the validity of that purported reduction or interference with the quantum of budget that they had presented to the finance ministry. And they said the information they had presented to the finance ministry was well, for their purposes only but it couldn't be reduced whatsoever. Then the court took paste on the basis of the independence of the, uh, of the Auditor General that has been guaranteed, I think, by the same Article 187. Then distinguished the independence in respect of three areas, financial independence, administrative independence, and political interference, uh, political independence. This case established that, that is the Supreme Court. I, I, I very soon I'm going to read what the court said in respect of this matter. Mm. In fact, on all three areas, the Supreme Court said the executive could not, under any circumstances, interfere with them. Okay. But that parliament could, mm. for instance, interfere with, if you like, redetermine the quantum of the budget that will be brought to it. Mm. Otherwise, to say so would mean that then any budget that they bring, whether it is superfluous or whether the budget is reasonable or not reasonable, then 
uh, they couldn't interfere. Yeah, and right. this is what he said. If you permit me, just yeah. permit me to just okay, do, do that. This is what he said. He says that the court, it says that through, through external auditing remains one of the critical building blocks of good governance in any democratic system of government. It constitutes a key oversight accountability mechanism in public financial management in respect or in relation to persons, institutions, and trusted with state resources. Hence, the extensive provisions covering the office of the Auditor General and the Audit Service, the constitutional oversight body mandated under the direction of the Auditor General to carry out this important function, the constitutional provisions under reference, underpin and secure their independence, political, administrative, and financial, and insulate, um, this is my emphasis, insulate the service against all forms of external pressures. But I do think that the interference relates more to political, administrative operations, whilst the financial independence is a very limited. This is an authority of the Supreme Court. And which is why I am asking, if they have opportunity now to deal with the matter that Prof has brought to them, why don't they? This is their own authority. So they have firmed up the, the constitutional guarantee of independence of the audit, audit, audit service, or, 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 or the service in their own judgment, their previous judgment. Mm. Very easy okay. for them to refer Okay, to. so you take a breather there, and uh, let me get to your point. And uh, fortunately, he has also been doing, you know, uh, some cases in this respect. When it comes to Yao Safo Marfo's issue, uh, he uh, successfully, you know, prosecuted the matter for Yao Safo Marfo. He was one of uh, those in that matter. Then so, he's so he's not conflicted. He's here. Of course. He can of course. represent of course. the interest properly. He's not conflicted. We have a duty right. to the whole nation. Right. Okay. We are not presenting him as someone who is speaking and it's, it's a disinterested party, not at all. That is my friend. Right, right. Okay. okay. So when you listen to hmm. particularly CSOs and CSO leaders, and let me begin with a part of what uh, one Ghana movement, when they issued their statement, they said. And then, so they refer to the Crow Associates matter as being the beginning of the Auditor General's woes. And then they speak about, they call the leave that he was asked to take as extra judicial, that there is no doubt that that was extra judicial. If you read the if you read the, CS, the CSOs Against Corruption, their statement also. So if you look at paragraph two of the Wangana Movement Statement, they say the latest twist to the hunt, and they are calling it a witch hunt, is as ridiculous as it is a most shameless act against the Auditor General, Yao, Daniel Yao Domelovo, who was extrajudicially forced to take 167 days leave from work at a critical point in time in the case against then senior minister Yao Safumafo over the Crow scandal. Then if you look at the CSOs against corruption, they too make a similar reference in their very first paragraph and they say that um, the letter that the president used, uh, issued comes barely a day after the Auditor General, Dom Levo, returned to his post from another unconstitutional directive that forced him to proceed on accumulated leave of 167 days. How do you defend a matter like this? Well, uh, thank you very much. I'm not here to defend any matter. I'm mm. just here to express my views as a citizen of Ghana. And also, as you said, I've had some relationship with some of these matters. 
But uh, you have been lawyer for the president in the petition, <laughs> and you have been lawyer for Safafu in the matter we are discussing. Yeah, well, so, yeah, we've been lawyers for a lot of others. Okay, we are just uh, humble to say that mm. there are other cases that you'll be surprised to know that I, I read them as the highest. A case I did it in Koko District Court, but we'll talk about that later. Okay. Now, I think that it, um, in my view, it is unfair to say that no reasonable person will say that the matters relating to Mr. Domnevo's um, retirement has nothing to do with other matters that have occurred before then. And, and use the Osafumafo case, for example, as one key example to establish the point they are making. I think it would may, in all due respect, also be unreasonable for one to make such an inference. First of all, it is also unfair for one to say that the executive has, uh, as it were, established a system by which Mr. Domlevo was to be removed, and that it is a clear case of the executive not fighting corruption. I think my friend made that, that point. But I will read to you what Mr. Domlevo himself has said about the president. Speaking at the anniversary of the Occupy Ghana versus Attorney General case, Mr. Domlevo said the executive has been very supportive. And I said it in Egypt, that the problem about Africa is that we set up all these structures and we don't fund them. But in Ghana, I have received not everything that I wanted, but a substantial increase in support. He goes on to say, praising the government, I must say the executive, this particular executive, or the government of Nanado in the previous gov uh, um, system, I hope you are aware, when there was a change in government, the first announcement we heard was a ban on procurement of vehicles. Is that not it? He asks. But this was the time government gave us, the audit himself, I mean his office, the permission to buy 34 vehicles to support the audit service. We had never bought 10 vehicles in the history of the audit service before. But this permission was granted. Up to today, some people are struggling to get clearance to recruit staff, but they have. I must say it has been a collaboration and I love it. I love it a lot. First, the legislature has been very supportive in approving budgetary allocation to the Ghana Audit Service, amount which are about three-fourths of what it was before I came into office. But the government gave us permission on two occasions. As of today, we have recruited from 2017 to date more than 400 additional staff just to support us to do our work. Okay. He emphasized. How can anyone, this is the man himself, making this statement. There may have been some actions or decisions taken, please allow me, that one may find, and it is within one's right, to be inconsistent with, with what one expects. But how can the person himself say this, and yet other aspects come up, and we say that it is in the context of a broader scheme not to fight corruption by the, exec by the president. Now, let, let's put that aside. Then we go to the issue about his date of birth and so mm. on. Be before that, July 27, 2018, yes. the Auditor General sent a petition to the president against the board chairman, Professor Edward Duajiman, and he, the board chairman of the audit service, and he complained bitterly about interference and undermining of his work. And after that, you and I know these things have played out in the public. That was long after he had said this about the government, no, right? No, this, this, the date is here. Mm. You can source my news DH, mm. Ghana News of Tuesday, 18 June 2019. What mm. you, you mentioned is 2018. Okay. Since 2019, you can go and check. So, so. Now, so the point is, is you, it you fine? You these statements were made in 2019. Okay. I mean, that is the source I have. 
You can uh, go and check. It was during the honeymoon period. You know, <laughs> Just go and but, check. Uh, if you know. if what I have here is wrong, mm. the fact no, that I he do made, recollect. the fact that he made this statement. But I think it, the no, follow-up. Can I please? Uh, can please, I? Because please, I was mm. very quiet. Mm. The fact that he made this statement has never been discredited anywhere. Whether it was in a honeymoon or whether after he has impregnated his wife or had sex, that is not the matter we are talking about. This is a matter he has declared to everybody. And I'm saying that when you go to the issue of the date of look, every, most people until recently have had issues with their date of birth, to be honest with you. I mean, there was one person who was being vetted for chief justice, and they said that your, your CV, in respect of your date of birth, contradicts what we have known you to be. So it means that you may have been in, uh, when you were six, o'clock, uh, six years, you were in class one and all that. He said, where well, my mother told me I was born during the period when there was a big bang, but he became chief justice. So I'm saying, but when you have filled the form and you have indicated that your date of birth is June, 1st June, 1960, then questions can be asked. And here is it that, so when people are saying that it's others who are imputing that statement to him, it is also unfair. This is his own letter, 27 February, 2021 on the letterhead of the Auditor General. And this is what he says, paragraph four. With regards to the 1960 date of birth, I noticed the mistake when I checked my information in the baptismal card. He himself filled the form. And I have a copy of the form. He put 1960 there. But he said he noticed the mistake. But for me, if he noticed the mistake, and the mistake has been corrected in accordance with law and established procedure, that is another matter to talk about. But let no one put it or impute it to others that they are the ones that have, like Professor Sari said, one person I have due respect for, that even that record may have been forged. Or words to that effect. You can correct me if they didn't mean that. But that, I understood him to say that that snitch record, and I have a copy here, may have been forged and that investigation should be conducted into it. That is fine, but the man has not denied. It's the same as the EC uh, woman who come to that, who said that, yes, I made a mistake. Everybody makes mistakes. But as to whether he made the proper correction, I think that he should take his time, send these decisions are made, and even the courts make decisions and they reverse it. Does it, matter, does it matter to you when this uh, digging is done about him? The times when these diggings are done about him and are used against him? Well, what I have seen is that it just didn't start in, in, around the time when he was coming. Letters have been written to him, inviting him to the board to have a discussion about these matters. Sometimes he didn't feel obliged. Other times he, he just went ahead to respond. Yeah, this year, yeah, because of issues of confidentiality, it may not also be fair for one, but he knows that it is not just we are on the day he was to come, or just so, days after so the that presidency, this started. The presidency says someone has signed a beneficiary form, and he says, I made a mistake on that beneficiary form. Someone tells the president yes. that that mistake on the beneficiary form, use it against that person, and the president goes ahead and uses it against that person without a process, as you may say as a lawyer, due process of law. Is that what you're saying? Is the presidency a court of law? No, the first point is that you, remember, you mentioned the, um, the case that Karine Macron did mm -hmm. against the um, Ghana Immigration mm -hmm. Service. Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court said that all public officers have the right to enforce the law. And that if we were to say that, in any case, that case went against my own good friend <laughs> anyway. The Supreme Court affirmed the processes and the steps that the, um, the Immigration Service took. And I found it. No, but, but we are talking about the principle. I'm coming. While the I'm case coming. was I'm ongoing, coming. Gary Nimaku was on the media. While the case was ongoing, he was very unhappy that his it, it, client it, it, was being deported while the case was ongoing. It, 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 that, is not, mm. that is not the focus now. You've asked me about Exactly. It. First of all, Article 58 mm. says clearly that for me, what I found to be the most fundamental function of the executive is the execution and maintenance of the laws of Ghana. Mm. And if the president who has such a duty, and which I find fundamental, not maybe, maybe not even 
commander in chief. Others may argue. But because of where I stand, Article 58 states, two, the executive authority shall, uh, shall extend to the execution and maintenance of this constitution and all laws made under or continued in force by this constitution. Article 199 states clearly that all public officers and the Auditor General is not excluded, shall retire at the age of 60. So if the president on the basis of this has acted in enforcing the constitution and, and the relevant laws, in maintaining, oh, you understand the word maintenance, we all understand the word execution, bringing into force and enforcing this, these laws. If you are dissatisfied, of course, like the EC situation, some the person against whom the decision was made who dissatisfied has gone to court. So are we expecting that if the executive strongly believes in their understanding and interpretation of the law, that someone has violated the law, and it is my duty to ensure that that violation does not persist? Then you the, say, let the, me go the to court. The question I ask you, the question I ask you, as a lawyer, yes, with all sincerity, that you, have to you will that. use <laughs> that you will use a beneficiary form, mm, which is a supplementary form, yes. to undo and amend original record, which is spread all over the man's record. Are you saying the president? This is the way he should enforce the law. Something. The and, and, that, and that the president, by his own fiat, can just get up and say, I'm enforcing the law. This the, is the way I the do it. The original record rather states that he was born on 1st June 1960. It is rather, that, that's a copy here. It is rather the corrected version that says 1961. That is, this is the original record. This is the original record. It is rather the corrected version that said that he was born 1961. No. And please, please, please. And that is why if. The corrected one rather said he was born 1960. You think anybody will act on it? What? This is the original what? form that he filled. What? And when he said, in any case, he's also saying that he was born on Thursday. Yeah. I have some two names I also bear with him. But this is the form. When it were initials of other names, he didn't take, he didn't write any initial. But that, that is fine. So my point is that the original form which is here. And I believe... Can, can you, can you, uh, uh, Professor Sari wants to come in, but can you tell me this? <laughs> no, uh, before can you tell does, me this? I, now, now, I want, I want right, you to right, answer right, to this. Right, right. What was he being investigated for that led to going to his uh, documents about uh, his, uh, his, uh, his date of birth and the rest of them? I, 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 but his original documentation as snakes. Once again, I had mentioned earlier that even on that supplementary form, the snake number gives you the date he insists is his date of birth. And it includes the 1961. And in fact, I have seen the very original of his form. And it is accurate to say that 1961 is what he has, he has is uh, there, is said. Is there an he explanation for this social security number? 377019. <coughs> We'll come to that, but I want to look at briefly the accusation or the um, expression of unhappiness about the case pending or the cases in the Supreme Court. And I think, Prof, with all due respect, I have a different perspective. And I will not go as much to say that it is a clear indication or it is, there is some indication that the executive or the judiciary and correct me if you didn't put it in that. My understanding is that you are saying the judiciary have in a way facilitated a certain agenda, which I have found to be unsubstantiated, not to give them level uh, um, justice. And I'm saying that be charitable if I didn't understand you well. But the point is that, Prof, you have been one person. If there's anybody who has filed or commenced actions in the Supreme Court in the past, 14 years or so, then that is you. And we are all happy that you give us opportunities to assess authorities, even when we are teaching our students and doing our cases. But you have been very passionate in, in the pursuit of these cases. So tell us, is it the case that your lawyers or yourself have written to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court have decided not to push your case for you? In any case, if there is a delay, 
that it is not the Supreme Court that will go searching for cases that are on the court list and be giving awarding to each of them or one, well, each of them priority over the other. I think that we all are interested in these matters. There's one I'm also handling, which also involved the audit service. There have been <coughs> some back and forth, also because sometimes the attorney general represents the auditor general, and the auditor general also has his own lawyers who have filed. So these matters have to be streamlined. So I, mm. I will advise that prof. Mm. This is a chief justice, as perhaps others also, who is very, very clear in his mind. I mean, when it comes to timing, this is a man who he says 9.30, 9.30 he's in the courtroom. And he has, and his administration have been but, but very, what, very, but very meticulous in that. But, but what Prof Sassari and the CSOs are raising is a fact that since the suit was filed, it has been there dormant, right. nothing since has happened. When you and they say sorry. that delay, that delay is also to blame for what has happened because mm. if they had heard the case, they would have given their orders. When you file a case, if you were in his the favor. attorney general mm. will respond. If the attorney general does not respond, the lawyers have procedures prescribed by law. You file and bring this to the attention of the court. Okay. If let, the attorney general let's, let, just, just let's, let's hear prof. Huh? If the attorney yeah. general has mm. filed, mm. the next process is the setting down of memorandum of issues. With it is the parties. Not by the central practice. All right. It is the parties that must agree and send it to the Supreme uh, Court. Okay. So, Prof, I think you can advise your people. We are all interested to do so. But to blame this on the Supreme Court, <coughs> I think that in my responsible view, I totally disagree. I see. Um, but you haven't seen cases where the Supreme Court has, has been proactive, so to speak, and, and takes the matter and asks people, go bring this, go bring that itself there are matters whether or not is the registry that is uh, part of engineering all of that to ensure that there's a speedy trial you write to the registry mm. and inform the registry without even writing the okay let's hear let's hear prof he's one of the, the registry he's one of the, the parties so we don't even know what he may have done okay so professor let's hear you but let me put once again on record that the original <laughs> documentation regarding uh, uh yao daniel domelevo uh Snit, date of enrollment, the original SNIT record. Date of enrollment is the 1st of October, 1978, I see here. And then the date of birth, as I can see, is uh, the 1st of June, <coughs> 1961. And then nationality, I have Ghanaian on it, and then, and so on and so forth. So, Prima uh, Feche, uh, this is actually the document that should be used to judge him and not any other document. Is that not so? Yeah, I mean, uh, Sanson, of course, uh, you are absolutely right. And uh, it's good to hear from my uh, brother Yao and then uh, Reina. Uh, I believe Yao makes several points that uh, could easily be dismissed. So, for instance, uh, he talks about the executive being the, I mean, the executive has some power to enforce the law. And if they see that somebody has done wrong, then they can act. I mean, that, that is almost like saying, if the president finds some document tomorrow, which shows that the uh, chief justice is 72, he can suamoto dismiss the Chief Justice, because he has a document in his possession which says the Chief Justice is 72. Or in the case of the Electoral Commission then, uh, Ms. Charlotte say and so on, uh, because there was some evidence that there were some uh, violations of the procurement law, the president then did not have uh, to use the uh, procedures outlined in Article 146, and he could just uh, have removed uh, uh, Charlotte Osei and the uh, members of the uh, commission. That's laughable. I mean, that, that's not, that's a, a, propos a proposition so absurd that it shouldn't be entertained for even one minute. The other point I would want to make is that the board, the board, the board of the audit service is not the board of the auditor general. This is at the heart of most of the dispute that we are talking about. The Audit Service Board is under the mistaken impression 
that it can control an independent constitutional officer. If you read the Constitution, Article 187, that's on the Auditor General. He, he is not subject to the control of any authority, not the Audit Service Board, not President, not anyone. That is something they don't understand. To audit the presidency, you have to be independent of the presidency. And you cannot create a board with five of the members appointed by the president. There's, there's a representative from the civil service, and then there's the auditor general who is, who is also a member of the board. You cannot have a, a, a board whose membership is dominated by the president's appointment exercising oversight over the auditor who is supposed to be auditing the pre president. That's a complete misunderstanding of Article 187, uh, 187, 188, 189. They have to be read carefully. Otherwise, we'll keep making the mistakes. It's completely wrong right. now, to think that the audit service now, board... Now, Professor, sorry. It's now, the board yeah. of the Auditor General's office. Okay, now, Auditor now General's Professor, sorry. Office. I, said, I said you are here. Thankfully, you are on this show. So we should find out from you. When we say the Supreme Court has delayed in hearing the matter before it, we have the CSOs also complaining because they also joined the suit. Nine of them joined the suit. I am reliably informed that your lawyers sent proposed issues. The Attorney General reviewed and also sent back, like we will always do, what he felt was the proper issues for trial. And this was done in November, December last year. The Attorney General yeah, has not heard from, Samson, if you, from, the, in from my, your lawyers since in, then. In the original statement of case and rate, we have issues and the Attorney General responded, they have their issues. The point is, the Supreme Court itself has to be sensitive to the time value of some of these uh, writs and some of these cases that are brought before them. Because if you go to sleep, you, the matter itself can become moot. And okay. that's why I gave you the December 31 yeah, but, example. But, but please answer my there question directly, like Prof. Please Amu answer case. my question. Every, that I need a direct yeah, yeah, answer. Hold on, hold on. Every, every judge, the Supreme Court justice themselves, because I've been at a presentation where they were there, and they agree with me that in the Amu case, the, the ball was dropped because it took too long to resolve the dispute. You cannot have a dispute about a parliamentary seat that has a tenure of four years and resolve that after, uh, after four years and think that you have done a good resolution. Yes, but the Georgia Amu case, once again, president, once again, it is fair to note always that we don't seem to remember that, that it is not as if the case was pending in one court and stayed in one court for four years. But that it had gone that. from one to the next. Now, now my, my question to you was, I'm, I'm, my I'm question just... to you is, what, how do you respond to this? That if your lawyers had responded as my far back are, as Dece my, my November, December, perhaps by now, that issue would have been dem, de, done with. My lawyers have responded uh, the, uh, with written letters. All of these things are really besides the point because the harm, the harm, the harm, the harm occurred in July. And when the harm occurred in July, the Supreme Court, as it has done in many cases, one of them is the Lukmensa case in Sunyani, where Lukmensa did not follow even the proper procedures. But the Supreme Court itself understood that it had a responsibility and it had to decide the issue. Otherwise, there will be bigger problems. Yeah, no, no. That is the decision. Pro but the transparency well. is important. As I understand, the last time the matter came up before the court, your lawyers were ordered to comply with certain earlier orders. And it appears they have not complied. So 
like the, the like the together like the CEO source on yourself, it is unfair the last time the to blame the court. The court was July, July, when we had the uh, injunction case, and it was dismissed, and then subsequently we filed our issues. The um, the attorney general provided their own input. And then we said, look, if we disagree on the issues, let's just file separate issues and then let the court re resolve the matter. But I am telling you something. These are all in the weeds. Okay. Because to me, mm. this matter should have been decided in July. Mm. Once you allow the auditor general to go on leave for 167 days, because uh, because of these uh, prof, issues. Prof, my, 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 my very final question to you would be that, so what, what do we do? Uh, there, are, there are some people who are suggesting that the civil society organizations simply issuing statements and organizing press conferences is not the way to be a vanguard for uh, the society. You must do beyond that. This is a clear case where some members of the public think you should begin to embark on demonstrations to let the president understand that once he's voted for, it doesn't mean that is the end of the citizens' participation in the process. Yeah, I, I agree. And that should have happened even uh, uh, in, in July when the man was asked to go to leave. So we are already five months or six months behind schedule. Let me also provide a few reasons why the civil society groups and people like me are very unhappy. Okay, with please do that in two minutes. Done. Yeah. Uh, uh, one, we feel most of us betrayed because many of us look up to the president. I was a very young man when I first saw the president as the secretary of the people movements for freedom and justice. And at that point, I formed a certain view of him that he was a man who was always going to defend the rule of law and a man who was always going to defend the constitution. So it comes as a shock that he has allowed himself to do what he has done. His legacy to me is permanently tainted because of this highly unconstitutional and unusual action. I cited the case of CQ first, the political kingdom and all else would be added. Look, this issue may not be related to the removal of the members of the Electoral Commission. It may not be re uh, related to the resignation of the special prosecutor. But when you put all of that together, it paints a mosaic of a president who seems to have difficulty working with independent constitutional officers unless the constitutional officers were appointed by him. And that's unfortunate because, right. as I said, mm. the issues may not be related. Mm. But somebody looking at the three things together will likely put them together. And it's, again, extremely, extremely uh, uh, unfortunate that right. it's happening. Now, now uh, the final Re point I want to make, the final point I want to make, Samson, is they are setting infractions of the Constitution where it is important that we all take off our political jerseys and put on our Ghana jersey. This is not an MPP, an NDC issue, an independent issue. This is a constitutional issue. If we are serious about having an Auditor General who is independent, is that our conception of what that office should be. That's right. the basic question. Okay, and thank so I you. I agree with yeah. uh, this call for demonstrations. The media should not let the matter die. Mm. This should be right. on until okay. the thank president you. himself thank you. Thank you. Now, now Reina, Reina uh, Kofi Bento says, Kofi Bento says, he says, uh, the Auditor General was sent on false leave, which he had not earned, and some were already forfeited. Two, he was then locked out of his office. Three, series of lawsuits against him were not even called. Four, his nationality was questioned. When all failed, he was retired forcefully when he had only few months to go. 
You want me to believe that this is a process that has been fair to him? Question, Reina. Um, the, the one Ghana movement, for example, in their statement, they are emphatic that if there was anyone deserving of an extension in their office, this is the Auditor General whose office, whose tenure you must extend because the government itself has proclaimed that he has helped to save specific amounts of money, millions of Ghana cities. Pre precisely so. And that is why, you know, it's, it's shocking, I mean, to, to uh, uh, many observers what is going on. And this is, you know, remember the case uh, Occupy Ghana did, mm -hmm. you know, as to firm up, there's, there's, uh, the provision was already there. Such charges and disallowances. Such charges and disallowances. There were no rules. There were no rules, but it was inactive. They were not applied. To. He is the very person who has been very, very, very good at this and has saved the nation millions and millions and millions. What do we want? We don't want someone who is saving the nation. And so in terms of his competence, in terms of the work he has done, it is there for everyone to see. And let me just say that today is Independence Day. So I invite my brother that when we're having this discussion, already he's shown we want to have discussions that are, uh, <clears throat> that can help push the democracy forward and push our institutions forward. I want to refer to two cases, one of which the president was involved in trying to protect the right of, of an individual who was removed from office. And I'd like to now say that the constitutional provision in terms of removal from office of constitutional officers has now been stratified. In the case of Justice Aban's case and the Tufo versus Attorney General, where he, when there was sub substitutious means to remove Justice Apalu as a justice of, of the court. And when the GBA went to uh, the Supreme Court uh, to seek the removal of uh, Justice Aban on grounds of morality, that he was not of high moral standing. The court didn't even address that matter. The court said, we must pay commitment to the textual nature of the constitution. When the constitution provides clearly the means of removal of, of an office, mm. these two cases established that you must go by that procedure. And I find the president's action, and also I was also a young man, when in the 1990s, this is the president led uh, the Kumi Preko movement and all of that. And I find that his actions and words are in constant conflict from the time that he assumed office as president until now. We want all to be inspired. Yeah, yeah. yeah they're in conflict. Maybe, maybe, maybe you mentioned Occupy Ghana. Maybe they are to blame for all of this. <laughs> because it is the exercise of the power of surcharge and disallowance, which many say is what has led this Auditor General into this trouble. Because... This is the power that has been given him and through which he was asking people, pay back this money, you, you chop this money, bring it back, and so on and so forth. And he dared to ask the finance minister to cough up uh, how much, over a million in, uh, a million dollars. He stepped, he's, I think that's mm. some, yes. that Let me, let me very, go very through unfair. them. Yeah, let me. Yes. Yeah. The matter has gone but, through the court. There is a definite Mr. decision. Pong. Please, please, may I? There is a have... definite decision made on this matter. Mm. Mr. Domlevo's own documents that uh, he he's re arguing report. his point. Please, I think... I? No, no, may I? This is a list of documents used by the Auditor General in the disallowance and surcharge in respect of which the appeal is allowed. This is the case that we were involved. Mm. The documents he attached include the agreement, the agreement those signed in um, September. 2017, it clearly says that it is to take effect, the effective date is February. You, he you, has you also say, attached... You say, you say, what have I done wrong? No, no, I'm saying that, uh -huh. I'm not you, but no, I'm saying that... I, I'm those, mentioning no, that yes. that is the this beginning. Is, is, I'm responding I'm to... I'm okay. those who mm. say so. All right. We're only summarizing what you say, okay. many say. Okay. I'm saying that those who say mm. that the beginning of Dom Levo's problems, if he has any at all, is the fact that he was bold enough to set to charge and people, including and disallowed expenditure by people, including the senior, the, the minister. senior minister. All these documents here, including the allegation that there was no procurement um, sanctioning, this is his own document. 
this, this is the approval by the procurement agency. Again, when he wrote to Mr. Osafumafu, Osafumafu wrote to him that we have the document. But because of national security issues, you may come and take copies. I can make copies of all these for you. The matter has gone far to the court. Uh, the uh, this is, this is a certainly, matter. No, I'm saying certainly, that it is certainly, very we will unfair. not have we will not have a debate it's fine. over but this it, matter. But, let us but, but you, you agree that people have an issue when you say the Auditor General of the State is seeking documents for the purposes of his functions, and you tell that Auditor General that because of national security, I won't give it to you. Who else will you give That's the documents to? I did not say I won't give it to you. I'm saying the documents are here. Okay. He himself attached it to the court. The, the senior minister wrote that we have the document. You can take steps to come and inspect them. Okay. And that, that was when? Be, that because was, is, is, it, is it not a matter of fact that at the time he was, the audit was going on and they needed these documents, they were unavailable. That, that he gave them time. That he gave them time. True. That is not true. Not this true. Not, not true. As in the auditor, uh, auditor general false. was lying. It is false. I won't say he's lying. It's mm. not in my nature. But <laughs> it is false for anybody to suggest. This okay. is the latest senior minister wrote. Okay. Is October 2019. Mm. This was before the disallowance was done. Okay. Where he said that other cases under investigation by Crow. Crow Associates are still conducting investigations into several other cases for the government of Ghana. They are considered as privileged and confidential information and reports which will be used in court at the appropriate time. They are, however, available at the office of the senior minister for your inspection and, and study. This is what is stated. Let me, let me, it's a let, document all right, that will be All right, all right, all uh, right. Yes, yeah, I need, I, need, I need to respond to this. Yeah, do, do in a minute. Yes, yes. I need to hear from uh, Dr. Abochi, who just joined us in some five minutes, and then we move to the next issue. That's fine. We can, we can clothe uh, your point is here very, very forceful in his... Don't clap. You, you, <laughs> he's here very forceful. And this is a court matter. You know, but you can, you can style it however you want it. You can clothe it and give it different names. You can say it's a cut. Don't impute. But if it's a but good, it's a good. This is a very clear matter for, for, for the public. Mm. Very clear so, that the troubles that... The heart troubles, heart the troubles, Daniel... And this is a good citizen. At a time that we don't have a lot of heroes, that he was emerging as one of our heroes, you needed to clip his wings. Clip from one stage of clipping and trying and not succeeding. Even when he was convicted for contempt, mm. you didn't even come out after violating the very, the so, very law that so he has sworn to, to enforce. We, we have a duty ah. to protect the Constitution. This is a constitutional matter. And Prof has called on all of us to make a contribution our constitutional. It is very grave matter me. as whether the security of independent constitutional entities and persons that occupy those uh, offices, whether they have that security or they don't have that security. The presidency is not an enforcing authority. It doesn't. Presidents make executive decisions which themselves are subject to law. And the president knows that there's procedure to vindicate any decision he wants to do. I am questioning why of all people, why he's not following the same procedure that he followed on Charlotte? Say, this is a legitimate question. Okay, all right, uh, uh, Dr. Abochi, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, if you have the opportunity of listening to uh, three of my guests, uh, what may be your final words? Perhaps looking at uh, moving forward. Uh, please unmute. Please unmute. Yes, um, sorry about that. I think the details have been discussed, the pros and cons. So I am just going to make one statement and speaking from the standpoint of constitutional law, academic constitutional law, I like to, I like to generalize things for the purposes of solutions moving forward. I think that Mr. Demelovo's situation has been characteristic in terms of his entry being dramatic and his exit being equally dramatic. The time of his appointment and the nature of his appointment created an impression that he has been foisted on an incoming government. He was appointed by an, ex by an exiting government at a certain time, and that creates a perception of being foisted on an incoming government that may have its own agenda. Ordinarily, that shouldn't be, because the Auditor General's position, being a constitutional body, is also a professionalized body. 
So it is insulated or it is designed to be insulated from the politics of the day. But given the nature of our politics and given the circumstances of his appointment and the timing of his appointment and the entry into office, it created that perception. Now, the danger with that is that because of the perception of his, of his being foisted, um, he constantly worked under that pressure. That ultimately appears also to have then been characteristic of his exit. So I think it once again betrays the need for constitutional reform, constitutional reform in the appointment process, because often the exit process only reflects the appointment process. And if we deal with the pressures and the inherent political dynamics of the appointment process, we would have cured the exit process. And I'm just saying this because it's important for us to also understand the fact that even though his work is a professionalized work, it has inherent political pressures. And the reason it has inherent political pressures is because it has impacts or it, it impacts the entire political establishment. If you are dealing with corruption and if you have a body or a person who is supposed to go out there and uncover and then surcharge, you cannot divorce or, or dis dissociate that from the political process of the day. So it's important that the appointment process itself is not only bipartisan, but nonpartisan. It's also important that the appointment process, therefore, appeals largely or generally to the entire political spectrum. So I think that his appointment process has ultimately impacted his exit, which has been unfortunate and which then may have consequences moving forward into the future. But it's important that the two leading parties at least create some consensus in this field. Because I think as a country, um, the Auditor General invariably represents a useful constitutional police officer uh, whose office wants to save that. But right. it's, a le it's a learning curve, right. given how he was appointed. And so uh, then, then can you help us um, with your uh, legal you know, knowledge to resolve one matter. Uh, where there is an apparent discrepancy in, in dates, on what basis would you prefer one date against the other? Uh, I want to understand the question. Where there's a discrepancy in dates, which dates? Where there is an apparent discrepancy in dates, and we are talking about Domelovo here, the date of birth. Ah, okay. On what basis do you prefer one date against the other? It may be a rhetorical question, but it has, a, it has an answer. Well, again, the simple principle is the simple principle rests on discretionary power, and the principles for the exercise of discretionary power are out there. The Supreme Court recently reiterated them in the just just ended decision, uh, just ended case whose decision came out, I think, on Thursday, and so that matter has been resolved. Um, what, but but an administrative entity must make decisions on the basis of certain variables, and so where there's a conflict between two dating, and these two dating all belong to state agencies. Um, one part, a, a party making the decision can decide to choose between the two of them, uh, which one he thinks is more convincing or which one he thinks is more accurate. But that decision or that selection invariably must be dictated by the principles for the exercise of discretion. In other words, we must be able to justify why one is preferred over the other. And in order to make a decision which is unquestionable, invariably the courts are the best places if we think that there's a challenge, uh, we think that we want so, to challenge a so, particular... So the, um, president, so the president has abused his power in this respect? I don't, I, no, I don't think so. I don't think on the face of it. Now, let's, let's be clear. The power to appoint invariably has the power to dismiss inherent no the president the, the, president, the president has not done a dismissal the president has issued a letter saying that he has been informed by the board chair that mr domelevo should have retired last year so he's simply asking him to go and leave he's not dismissed yeah. him uh, he's simply he's simply asking him to take his mm -hmm. retirement thanking him for his service question is the letter bases the retirement on the choice of date of birth that has been presented to the presidency. Right. 
So, and I understand your point. Your point being, why must there be a selection of one and not the other? And I'm indicating the general principle that the general principle is that when a decision is being made between two options, that has to generally be based on the principles of discretion. Now, in applying the principles of discretion between two competing documents or two computing data from two different state institutions, an administrative body or an administrative entity so, or so an authority Kabuti, of state... Let me, let, me add this, let me add this to help you to uh, get this final. <clears throat> there are no two documents from two different institutions. Yao Domelevo has his SNIT enrollment documents. The very original contains the date 1961. Then the chair of the audit board uses a beneficiary form that he signed to vary this date. And the president takes the beneficiary form as the basis, the, 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 what is found on the beneficiary form, prefers that as against the document that one may say is prima facie what it ought to be. Mm. Invariably, okay, so again, it may appear to be an exceptional case. And I think the point I was just trying to make, so if it's not from two different entities, but from one entity, Whatever the competing data is, the choice made must be made on the basis of the objective exercise of discretionary power. And I think you are trying to drive home the point, the fact that if the entry data, which is the data that captures the bio data of the person, the, the, the information that captures the bio data of the person, as opposed to a form which was failed to say, claim benef benefits for someone or to guarantee something for someone, your argument is that ultimately the entry data, which is about the entry bio data, should be stronger. Ordinarily, that's correct. The entry bio data should be stronger. I guess, and, and have to be honest about this, and I think you are correcting it factually, I am not fully in, in, in possession of all the facts. But if what you're saying is the case, then obviously, yes, there are questions to answer on the basis of why there's a preference for one and not the other. Ultimately, however, whatever decision is taken, whatever decision is made, on the basis of Article 23, which is the administrative exercise of discretionary power, it must be fair and candid. We have to show that there are no preferences, there are no subjectivities, there are no biases, etc. But in the absence of that, of course, whoever exercised that decision will have questions to answer. Um, you know, it, the, the, the whole controversial character of the relationship between the Auditor General and the Audit Service Board also unfortunately fits into all these allegations and all these suspicions all right. and makes matters complicated because okay. otherwise on the face of it mm. one will expect that when these decisions are made they are informed by good faith and so people don't ordinarily question them okay thank you very much uh, dr Bochi. we take a break when we return i read your messages on this subject and then we attempt briefly to look at what has happened in parliament and the minority in parliament feels that it is under siege it says it is very disturbed and that it has never had such a difficult time in uh, their life like now. We'll be right back. You're welcome back. This is Newsfile. It's your most authoritative news analysis platform. And here on Newsfile, we put Ghana first. Uh, so some of you have sent in some messages and I'm going to share some of them with you. Uh, beginning with... Um, uh, Kwame, Nana Kwame says, uh, don't be marveled as to how Domelevo's personal data at SNIT was leaked uh, to Facebook. And for that matter, the audit service uh, board, uh, Professor Sari should not be surprised. Isn't uh, Mr. Osafumafo's son a director <laughs> or or management member at SNIT. Didn't Domelevo investigate his father and discovered some uh, wrong that went to court and so on and so forth on the Kroll Associate? Okay. So, yeah. Um, then, Togby, Togby, okay, let me read a couple from here before Togby. In Goire Fiaga. That name always difficult to pronounce. 
<laughs> it's too long, so I'll read just a portion of it. It says, the truth is, considering the rancorous uh, nature of our politics, the last minute appointment of the Melovo by the president at the, at the time itself was wrong, particularly knowing that a new president had been elected and that such actions may have consequences. Any analysis of the issue ought to start on that note. Okay, so your point is noted. Then, those of you tweeting, uh, A.B. Mensa says, his wings had to be clipped like that of the special prosecutor, Martin Amidu. Collins Little Tete says, his appointment came in as a mole being planted in a setting regime. Emmanuel J. Bequen says, uh, no true patriot will ever defend Dom Levo's sacking. Um, Big Boy 